Good morning. I'm glad that you are joining us for worship on this Ascension Sunday and Memorial Day weekend. I'm Andy Dunning. I'm the pastor here at University Park United Methodist Church. This video is being shown both on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. And from 10 to 11 this morning, we are responding to comments live on both those platforms. The video will remain up for you to watch later if you'd like. If you are with us today for the first time, I want to extend a special welcome to you. Until we get to return home to our sanctuary for worship, you can find us on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. For 125 years, University Park United Methodist Church has worked to be the hands and the feet and the heart of Christ in our neighborhood and the world beyond. We are committed to create and strengthen authentic community and to support one another, not only through this pandemic but through all of life. If you'd like to check in on our comment string and just say hi, let us know you're joining us, we would love to hear from you. If you are new to worship at U Park, please feel free to use that comment space this morning to ask questions about our church. I will be happy to get back to you. Also, please do click that subscribe button on YouTube. The more people who subscribe, the easier we are to find online. And so we really appreciate your help. Whoever you are, Wherever you are this morning, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, we are delighted to have you with us in worship. When the epidemic is under better control and our community is back home here in our church sanctuary, we would love to have you join us for worship. So welcome this morning to our Sunday worship. I am grateful to Abby Hyder for leading us in our call to worship. Good morning, I'm Abby Hyder and I'm a change agent. Ascension, a poem by Malcolm Geith. We saw his light break through the cloud of glory whilst we were rooted still in time and place. As earth became a part of heaven's story and heaven opened to his human face. We saw him go and yet we were not parted. He took us with him to the heart of things. The heart that broke for all the brokenhearted is whole and heaven-centered now and sings. Sings in the strength that rises out of weakness. Sings through the clouds that veil him from our sight. Whilst we ourselves became his clouds of witness and sing the waning darkness into light. His light in us and ours in him concealed, which all creation waits to see revealed. It's fun. 
Good morning, my name is Bethany Hader Krabs and I am your Director of Wholeness and Healing and I would like to invite you to participate in our Building Beloved Community moment this morning. In the words of Mr. Rogers, there are many ways to say I love you. There are many ways to say I care about you. And so what I would like for you to do today is to share with the people in your household or in our live stream chat what things make you feel well loved what actions or words or gifts help you feel loved. Our hope is that this will help all of us to be able to express better with one another that we care about them and we love you. I invite you to share now. Acts chapter one, verses six through 11, the ascension of Jesus. So when they had come together, he, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, It is not for you to know the times or periods that Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses. In Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This is Jesus who has been, ta been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. <laughs>
calling all change agents. Report to headquarters for your next mission. assigned to this mission as a justice and activism agent. So I work in intelligence and that involves collecting a lot of information, mostly information about different types of organizations. Everyone I work with gets information they need to know and we do not get information that we don't need to know. In the Bible, we kind of learn that being humans on earth is a bit of a need to know mission. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says there are some things we specifically do not need to know. He reminds us of our role in the mission. That's to look forward at the moment we're in now and react to God's assignments as they come. We should not try to figure out how the mission ends or get distracted trying to think about how we think it should be going. Here's some need to know information that God gave us, change agents, to complete the mission. We know good from bad. This is classified information for other living things, so it's a big deal that we get to choose whether to act good or bad. We know to care for the earth. We don't know what will happen to the earth, and we're not really supposed to know. But we do know that God assigned us to take care of it. This is something that the Justice and Activism team takes really seriously, because protecting our headquarters is super important. Above all, we know to act and speak with unconditional love. That's our main assignment. It's something you can do at any moment, small or big. Your mission is clear. Spread love. Don't try to peek at God's classified files. Let's pray. Dear God, every moment is alive with your presence. When we give ourselves more and more to a life of constant communion with you, we find that we simply have no time to worry. Help us to walk with you in holy trust, responding to your plans rather than trying to make things fit our plans. We trust you to show us what we need to do when we finish what we're doing now. Amen.
One morning about, I don't know, seven years ago now, I was part of a staff at Denver Urban Ministries and I was on a shift at the front desk. We were pretty full that day. We had a lot of people in our waiting area, but generally things were pretty quiet. And then this young woman walked down the stairs from our employment services program on the second floor. And she walked up to the front desk where I was sitting and she said to me, I have a job interview. And I said, congratulations, that's great. But then these big tears kind of started up in her eyes and her hands started to shake. And she said, I've never had a job. I've been in prison for the last five years. I have never been to a job interview. I don't know how to do this. Now, in the back row of our waiting room was this very kind, soft-spoken woman named Joanne. Joanne had been in a few times, and she and I had gotten to talking, and I'd gotten to know her a little bit. And Joanne looked at this scared young woman, and she said, Honey, where are you going? Where where do you need to be for the interview? And so the young woman brought a piece of paper over to Joanne to show her the address. And Joanne looked at it and said, Oh, I know where this is. This is easy. What you want to do is get on the 15 bus going west on Colfax. Now make sure you get a transfer because you're going to run down to Broadway and catch the zero going south. Just before Evans, that's where you want to get off. It's right there. And honey, don't worry. You're going to be fine. Now, Maybe it was Joanne's words, or maybe it was just Joanne herself, you know, her presence, who she was. But whatever did it, that short conversation enabled this shaky, scared young woman to gather herself up, take a deep breath, and head out the door. So what does the kingdom of heaven look like? How do we know it when we see it? How is God revealed in our midst? Today's scripture tells us that for 40 days after Jesus was dead and buried, he was somehow seen alive over and over again by his closest friends. The author of Acts says that he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs. So it's him, they they all know it. But somehow he's become more than he was. He can look like different people. He can just appear to them and then disappear just as suddenly. He can show up in rooms where the doors are locked or mysteriously accompany people on the road or at dawn on the lakeshore. He's capable of being anywhere, it seems, of looking like anyone. And that's part of the message, I think, of these stories. The spirit and the presence of Christ can be and often are revealed through those around us. But through all of these strange occurrences, the author of Luke and Acts says that for those 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus spent time with his followers and he taught them about the kingdom of heaven. So then in this morning's reading, the disciples ask him, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? I mean, he's been with them and talking about it for 40 days. Is now the moment, they want to know, is now the moment when it finally happens? Is now the moment when he's going to triumph over Rome, throw out the empire, usher in the reign of God? Jesus' answer had to be somewhat frustrating. Because they want to know, is now the time that he's finally going to do that thing that we read about in the Bible's final book, the Revelation to John, you know, where he rides in with a drawn sword and vanquishes the enemy and the people of God come to power and reign forever? It may seem like an odd question to us, but for those first century apostles, it actually makes sense because even though the revelation to John had not been written yet, the expectation of what Christians would eventually come to call the apocalypse, that expectation had been around for centuries. In the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus, prophets like Ezekiel and Daniel and others had written dramatic visionary literature about the end of time when God restores all creation to right relationship. So, This was an expectation that all first century Jews would have known about, whether they thought it was about to happen or not. 
And after all, Jesus' followers had just witnessed his execution. The Romans tried to kill him, and then they saw him alive. The Romans tried to kill him, and they couldn't. He returned somehow stronger and more than he was before he was assassinated. So his followers naturally think that now might be the time when he finally comes fully into his power, expels the Romans from the Holy Land, and takes over. And like I said, I imagine Jesus' answer with all that expectation on their part, was kind of a disappointment. Because he says, it's not for them to know the time. They don't get to know the answer to their question. They need to return to Jerusalem and wait. And there, he says, they will be given power by the Holy Spirit. And they will be his witnesses to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then... And what I think has to be one of the weirdest moments in the entire Bible, he just sort of floats away on a cloud. He just rises into the air and kind of keeps going until he's completely out of sight. That moment is about as far as it is possible to get from this great end times apocalyptic battle that's supposed to conquer evil once and for all and restore God's rule over creation. Jesus offers them this final instruction about being witnesses and then he just sort of floats out of sight. And they're all standing there going, um, thanks, I guess. Now, besides the whole floating away on a cloud thing, there are two other elements of this story that I think are important to notice. The first is the orders that Jesus gives his followers. They are to be his witnesses, he says, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now, what that little sequence doesn't say is that the people in these areas are at minimum foreign to one another, and at worst, worst, they are hostile to one another. I mean, the people of Judea hated Samaritans, and Samaritans were not exactly big fans of Judeans either. And then beyond their homelands were a whole bunch of people who had different languages, different customs, and different gods. And Jesus wants his followers to create a new people that includes all of them. And somehow, this small team, the 12, the now 11, is supposed to get all of this done without being able to count on God riding over the horizon on a war horse to get everybody in line. They don't get to use force. They don't get that kind of backing. They don't have the force, the power, the strength to use. Somehow, they have to create this new community by speaking their own truth, trusting the power of the witness that they have to offer, their stories, their lives, the community they have founded, the way they live together, what they have seen and know to be true about God with them. Now, the witness that they can offer is important, it turns out, because Jesus doesn't exactly answer their question about when God's final triumph is going to occur. But at the same time, he doesn't exactly not answer it either. They ask whether this is the time that God will restore the kingdom to Israel. Jesus doesn't say yes or no. He just says they don't get to know God's timing. It's not the same as saying it won't happen, but it's not exactly a satisfying date you can circle on your calendar either. As the New Testament scholar Robert Wall puts it, what Jesus does instead of answering their question clearly and explicitly is place Israel's restoration in the context of the church's work, which is like Jesus is saying, you don't get to know when it happens, but you can know this. What you do is part of it, who you are is part of it. The community you form is part of it because all of these things are the witness that you have. In one way, it's like the disciples' hopes and Jesus' response could not be further apart. They expect a climactic battle that finally ends with the struggle of good and evil, with good triumphing over all, And Jesus wants them to go and be his witnesses to people who've done nothing but struggle with each other for as long as anyone can remember. The disciples want Jesus to reign in triumph over all the earth. He just floats out of sight. In this very short passage are two very different ways of thinking about what may come next. But in the end, maybe there's a way in which they're not so different after all. 
For centuries, even in the time of the apostles, the end of history had been depicted as trials and visions and blood and drama, what the disciples call the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, what we've come to call the apocalypse. But the word apocalypse itself, that's a Greek word that simply means revelation, something that has been revealed by God to us. That's why the final book of the Bible is called the Revelation to John. It's what John saw in a vision, what was revealed to him. So to get back to the disciples' question, to get back to Jesus' answer, what restores the kingdom of heaven? What reveals it to us and to the world? What if the kingdom of heaven is revealed both in whole and in part at the same time in relationships and communities in which people and creation are being made whole? See, I think it's a natural human tendency to look for some dramatic event that makes everything right, a decisive victory, the triumph of our violence over the violence of our enemies, one moment that restores the world to its intended order once and for all. But, you know, somehow that never does seem to quite work out. Wars fought to end all wars. We've had plenty of those, and they don't. Violence on a massive scale never seems to inaugurate an eternal reign of peace. The final solution is never final or a solution because that's just not the way that human transformation works. It's not the way that we are made whole. It's not the way that human relationships or communities work. And it is certainly not the way that intimacy with God comes about. These things happen slowly, sometimes in ways we don't even notice. Slowly and quietly, we come into wholeness. And as much as I hate to say it, that slow, quiet process may be the only path that truly leads to the restoration of the kingdom. If that's true, then Jesus' instructions and his non-answer to the disciples' questions then those begin to make some sense. Our spiritual life, our community of faith, the truth we tell about how we have seen God in our midst, all of that then is part of the reign of God coming to be. Now in one way, maybe that's reassuring. I mean, it is always nice to think that our lives matter in some ultimate sense, and I genuinely believe that they do. But for me, in another way, It's almost scary because if Jesus' invitation to be his witnesses to the end of the earth, if that is the way the kingdom is slowly, patiently, gradually restored, that says we don't get to count on that magical end time reckoning that puts holiness and goodness in charge forever. We have to make our own contributions to that outcome here and now in whatever small ways we can. Jesus' final instruction to his followers tells us that sometimes contrary to appearances, what we do matters. Where we stand matters. Our moral commitments matter in a much bigger sense than we usually realize. Our spiritual practice matters, not just to us, not just in our small circles, not just right now. But in the grand scheme of things, our kindness matters. Our efforts at creating justice, those things matter. They matter not just here and now, but perhaps in God's time, for all time. And if that's true, it tells me that what happened in Denham's lobby that morning might have looked insignificant. I mean, the only people who even saw it were me and this group of people sitting around in the waiting room far enough down on their luck that they came to us for food or medical care or legal help or rental assistance. But in Jesus's way of reckoning, those people are the kingdom's insiders. And that event is part of God's work to restore the world. Those two women, the one who was afraid of her job interview and the one who offered her comfort and strength, they weren't in a church, but they were church. They had been clothed with power from on high, the power to reveal God in our midst. And if we are willing to recognize that kind of power, then we too are changed. Now, of course, this is not the kind of power depicted in the final battle of the Revelation to John. But what the disciples are asked to do 
in becoming witnesses, what those two women did in the Denham lobby that morning, what we are asked to do in our church and our neighborhoods and our workplaces and our world is literally an apocalypse. It is the power of God revealed. It is the way that God shows up, the way that the kingdom of heaven takes root. Like most things that are associated with God, it is easy to overlook or underestimate. It's easy to look at that interaction and say that it didn't mean anything or that it doesn't feel like enough. But in the end, the power of communities that make compassionate relationship possible, that make growth possible, that make healing possible, communities that include Judeans and Samaritans and all of us other ones may be the only vehicle through which God can restore right relationship and heal the wounds of human rage and fear and isolation. Amen. Tomorrow is Memorial Day, when we pause to remember and give thanks for those who have given their lives in service to our country. In a larger sense, it is worth recalling that sacrificing for the greater good is a deeply Christ-like value. And those sacrifices take place in large and small ways every day. I don't intend by saying this in any way to cheapen the service of those we honor with tomorrow's holiday. Rather, it's to give thanks for the commitment and the love that leads people to place themselves at risk of harm, and even in some cases, to give their lives on behalf of others. Throughout this pandemic, just as in the bravery of those we honor on Memorial Day, we've seen that kind of selfless service, and we have seen the cost. So before we join in prayer this morning, I want to take a few seconds to invite you to name out loud the military servicemen and women and others who you may know who have sacrificed themselves so that others may live. If you'd care to type those names into our comment string during this time of remembrance and prayer, all of us who are worshiping together today can recall them as well. Let's take a moment now to name those we honor. I invite you to join me in prayer. God of love, God of eternal presence, God of selfless sacrifice, today we recall the day of your ascension into heaven. We recall your commission to your disciples, your followers, and we are thankful that you have invited us to count ourselves among their number. On this Memorial Day weekend, we remember those who have gone before us, who have sacrificed their own lives in service to our country, in service to the greater good. We ask that you would give us the strength, the vision, the courage, and the wisdom to live in a way that is worthy of their sacrifice. Guide us to create a world that is worthy of their dedication. Give us the wisdom to be the people who you have asked us to be throughout your life and in your ascension, witnessing to your life among us through the lives that we live, through the communities that we form. We pray all of these things in the name of the one who gave himself up for us and who taught us to pray, saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
At a time of blame and anger, of fear and anxiety, may God make all of us witnesses to the peace, strength, and hope of Christ. May this be your witness. Where there is hatred, may you so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. And where there is sadness, joy. And may the love of Christ and the wisdom of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you always, now and forever. Amen.